uh, for the session today. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Simon, hello. Uh, yeah, so uh, there's a few good questions in the comment going, what is this? <laughs> so I guess let's, maybe we didn't make that like that, that clear. Uh, so yeah, my name's Simon Wiley, I'm from the UK, I run a consultancy and I do lots of things around Databricks, Spark, data lakes, data engineering, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and I started off as like a Microsoft BI person. So doing lots of SSIS, building queues, building SSRS reports, all lots of on-prem traditional SQL Server. And these days it's different. These days I spend most of my time in Azure, in the cloud. I'm very Microsoft focused still, but I do so much stuff with Databricks, building out modern Spark architectures and doing all that kind of stuff. And we thought we'd kind of just, um, Danny and I have a chat and talk about where we came from, talk about how we got here, talk about what that journey looked like. And we did a session and we got a ton of questions, uh, but we were so busy just talking about kind of that journey and swapping stories that we didn't really get time to get to any questions. So this is just meant to be the, you're a Spark Lake engineering person now. How do you get there? What are your questions? What's a lake house? So any questions you're throwing in the chat, the plan is for me and myself and Denny to kind of just talk about it and talk about what we think. Perfect. I think you covered it extremely well. Um, so <clears throat> my name is Denny Lee. I'm uh, based in Seattle, Washington, though I originally am uh, for the person on LinkedIn Live that noted that he's from Halifax. I'm actually originally from Newfoundland. Yes, I'm not, I know, realize I'm not the most obvious Newfie around, but yes, I'm actually a Maritimer as well, originally. Um, a little bit my history, exactly what uh, Simon called out. Um, we want to answer lots of your questions when it comes to become all sparky data engineering, right? But how did we get here? Uh, myself, I'm um, in addition from originally being from Newfoundland and uh, originally supposed to be a doctor, you know, after all of Asian parents. So that's what was supposed to happen. Um, <clears throat> what happened was that I ended up going to McGill University in Montreal specifically to become a doctor. And then that's where I've learned computer engineering. And then <laughs> here we go. So I ended up joining Microsoft uh, as a um, I think what web developer even like, yeah, that's now I'm aging myself really nicely here. <laughs> uh, but in the process of doing all this, I uh, ended up joining the SQL Server team. So I'm actually an old database guy, um, was on the team that helped uh, build what you now know as HD Insight. So both either you can uh, say thank you or I can apologize, whichever one you want to take. That's completely cool with me. Uh, and then of course, now I'm currently at Databricks. Um, as a developer advocate, loved working with Spark early on, so they were silly enough to let me join the company. So here we are, same idea, um, lots of cool questions. Um, and actually, we've got a great question right from the get-go. I figured this would happen uh, right from Raymond. What happened to my arm? Yes, well, I'm an idiot. That's what happened, actually. And so the quick call out, for example, is that, uh, not example, excuse me, um, was that I decided to, um, um, re-aggravate my uh, rotator cuff injury. Now, why would you say, why, why, why did I do that? Well, it's because I decided to go and do some PT over the weekend. And, but except I did the PT watching American football. Uh, the Seahawks were having a tough game with the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, our run defense wasn't working very well, so it was very stressful. So what was supposed to be only 10 to 15 minutes of PT resulted in about three hours of PT. Uh, I celebrated after we won um, and then realized, wow, my arm hurts. <laughs> so here we go. So that's what happened. And now I'm currently <laughs> wearing a sling to compensate for my idiocy. So there we go. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, before we get to the rest of the questions, I did want to call out, we want to thank Karen for uh, returning from her, uh, from returning to leave. She's been a rock star uh, data and AI online meetup. Uh, we sorely miss her and we're really thankful to have her back. She's going to be helping us take care of the questions. So thank you, Karen. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, I'm excited to be back. Tired, but excited <laughs> to be here. <laughs> As I'm sure Sleep's overrated. So yeah, that has kids. <laughs> Cool. So let, let's dive into the first questions. Karen, do you want to start off or do you want me to start off? Um, why don't you start off, Denny? I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, grabbing um, some questions. The questions. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, cool. Uh, well then, hey, Simon, let's start off with the first question we got here. Can you talk about some of the pros and cons 
in, ter in terms of AWS Databricks instances versus Azure Databricks instances? And are there any key differences? And yes, go Hawks. Woohoo. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, so I, I can talk about the Azure side of things. So I, I am so heavily entrenched over in Microsoft land that everything that we do, all the clients that we have are Azure clients. Um, and all the bonuses, all the things that they, they pick out in terms of that side, it's integration, right? So the actual engine, the thing that kind of actually does the grunt, the Databricks core Spark engine, that's, as I understand, the same. Let's say it's the same thing plugged in both sides, but it's how the workspace talks to the rest of stuff. So you've run Azure, so certainly what, a week and a half, two weeks ago, they came out with the Power BI Azure Active Directory connector, things like that, just plugging in more and more to the Microsoft ecosystem. Being able to talk via Active Directory is a huge thing for security. Being able to do the VNet injection in terms of uh, into the Azure architecture, that's, that's a huge one for getting it to be secure. And all things like private link and all that kind of stuff. Anything that we're talking about in, in the Azure kind of thing, it's all to do with how it plugs into the esoteric things to do with Azure. So, and that tends to be kind of the main core differences that I've seen. Uh, I think there's one or two things like, um, so I think AWS already has spot VMs, I think, was that's coming soon in Azure. So it's kind of, there's always yes. like parity, and it's all to do with the infrastructure, right? It's yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah, so things. AWS definitely has spot VMs, yes. Yeah. No, we, don't, we don't yet in Azure land, and they announced that it's coming later this year, which is cool, but that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. So it's less, what does the actual engine, the box do? It's how does this whole thing talk to the cloud platform tends to be the differences that I see. Perfect. And so just to add, chime myself in, since uh, I came from both the Databricks, uh, sorry, the Azure perspective and also have the AWS perspective, um, there, it, it really is about which ecosystem you or ecosystem you want to use, right? Um, and I, I'm, there's a little play on words here in terms of ecosystem versus ecosystem is, is there, it's the same word, but just said in a different way, obviously, right? But the context is in a lot of ways, the clouds are in a lot of the same way, right? Um, Obviously, the some of the programming styles uh, for the Azure ecosystem, you um, if you're more used to .NET, for example, obviously that Azure makes a ton more sense, right? But each both systems have their own version of integrations, right? They both have a cloud storage system of some type, like you know S3 versus ADLS Gen2, right? They're both mesh grid networks, right? Um, so um, I've got lots of stories. In fact, maybe I'll go into it later, but um, a lot of stories about uh, uh, what happens when you don't have a mesh grid network, okay? So in terms of collapsing your, uh, saturating your network, basically. Yeah. Um, but the, the point is that, you know, each one of them has a, a bunch of really interesting mechanisms, uh, different PaaS services, VM services. So it really depends on which one you really are plugged into more. And in fact, for many people or many customers for that matter, they're actually plugged into both, right? They have both AWS and Azure. And for that matter, the other clouds as well, um, just because they want to have a multi-cloud solution, right? And, and there's pros and cons to each approach, right? So for example, if you decide that you only want to use the AWS ecosystem, there's the advantage of saying, now I can just integrate directly with working with, you know, Kinesis, for example, or specifically um, uh, um, uh, uh, with Glue as their meta store, right? Or if you say, turn around and say with Azure, yeah, well, but in, at the same time, now I can be plugged into the VNet infrastructures, right? Mm -hmm. I can be plugged into the security. We all, okay, maybe love is a little too strong word, but lots of people like, really like using AAD, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of identity security. Yeah, and all completely valid, completely true. And so, often more times than one, you'll end up leaning to one ecosystem because of a set of features that makes more sense for you, right? And then all of a sudden where the multi-cloud kicks in is then it's because, for, and we have, and at least there's plenty of customers that do this, like where they actually have AAD. So that's why they're, uh, that's the reason why they start off with the Azure ecosystem, but they loved a particular AWS um, uh, set of components too. So at least when it comes to Databricks, we're like, yeah, we work on both. So it doesn't really matter, right? So you do you, do you right? You do what you think is best for you. And so we're not really leaning you one direction or the other. There, there are explicit advantages on one over the other, but at this, by the same token, that list is so long, <laughs> 
Right. That Simon and I would go on for hours. And so we, <laughs> so we're, we're going to stop now just because like I said, this conversation will get really, really long. The, the one thing yeah. I would generally say is if you choose the one that's nearest to your data, right? Mm -hmm. So most, I think, yes. I think it has the same, certainly in Azure, there's a cost for taking data out of Azure. It's free to put data into Azure, but if you're taking it out of one of the Azure data centers and moving it somewhere else, there's an egress cost. So if you, like, if you build Databricks in like so for in AWS over there and you've got all of your source data and you've got terabytes and terabytes of source data over there and you're pulling it out, it's just going to cost you my money. So <laughs> generally it's put it close to your data and it'll be a little bit cheaper. That's, and then if you're aggregating it and you're making result sets and then you move those aggregated data sets somewhere else, that's cheaper because you're moving less data. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, no. Uh, Simon, you hit it dead on. I mean, most of the customers that actually have to deal with multi-cloud environments, that's exactly what they do. They basically process the data, have a minimal amount that's sitting, that needs to be transferred from one environment to the other, right? If they, for sake of argument, need to transfer the data from AWS to Azure or vice versa, or for that matter, like I said, the other clouds, right? You know, they need to transfer it to a Google cloud structure or whatever else. Yeah, they, they try to minimize the amount of data. And so often what we'll see our customers do is they'll, they'll take a, make use of Databricks to basically aggregate the data and be prior to transfer of the data, right? So th this is a very good approach to minimize the, the overall cost, basically. So yeah, anyways, yeah, I think we covered it. Uh, anything else you think we, we should add? I don't think so. I okay. mean, certainly that gives enough people to start making that choice. If people have specifics going, what do you make of that? We can look at it, but yeah, I think that covers. Okay. Cool. Let's dive to the next question because it looks like at least from LinkedIn live right now, it looks like there's a lot of good questions and we got some questions from Zoom and YouTube. So let's let's go through the, the next set of questions so we can start answering those questions too. All right. Um, the next question, what is the difference between Lake House and Delta Lake, right? Because we did talk about lake houses. Uh, so did you want to start first or would you like me to start first, Simon? You, you, feel free. You go for the official database answer. Okay, cool. I'll go for the official Databricks. So the official Databricks answer would be Lake House is an architectural pattern, or you'll often hear, you know, the marketing for we're phrasing an architectural paradigm. <laughs> okay, so it's a pattern that brings a power and reliability of traditional data warehouse functionality combined with AI and ML to cloud data lakes. Yes, I'm reading exactly from a script, by the way, but minimally enough, I wrote it. So it's okay that I, that I did that. And that was, that was actually from a live question from before. But the, the real context basically is this, all right? There, just because, uh, when we made that shift to data lakes, which was a good shift, by the way, I'm not saying it was a bad shift, but we forgot to do a lot of things. And this is coming from a SQL hound. And, and I'm sure Simon will uh, toss in lots of comments on his own on this one, right? We forgot a lot of things. We forgot, for example, simple things like, what is your model of your data? We kept on getting obsessed with this idea of schema on re, schema on re, schema on re. Yeah, we'll figure it out later. Except now what you have is a lot of noise as opposed to data. A lot of, there's little actual insight or information coming from it because we're so busy shoving it in there. And it doesn't mean data lakes themselves are a bad idea. It's just more that we got inherently lazy. We forgot to apply software engineering practices to this when we said schema on read. And so the whole context to say, wait, well, what were the advantages of database technologies or data warehouses? the idea that we actually had structure, the idea that we have practice. Now, some of those practices made no sense, by the way. Okay, I wanna be very clear. And that is a, is, a, is a whole other conversation that I'm sure Simon and I will go on for hours on. So, so let's not do that right now. But the context is that there's a bunch, uh, at least from a manageability perspective, mm. okay? And at least from a having some form of rigor, Okay, irrelevant of the debate on what rigor we should take, but just in terms of there is a rigor, there is some form of structure, that there is some form of man simplicity and manageability, simplifying. That's what data lakes are definitely missing. Okay, and so because of that, the idea is that a lake house paradigm or this concept is saying, well, take some of the great things that we learned about databases, some of the great things we great learned from lake uh, from data warehousing and apply that to our data lakes so that way our data lakes become actually useful, right? It, it doesn't preclude the fact that you may still have a raw zone that you just dump the data because in some cases that's still very, very, very appropriate. But it does say that don't think about the rigor and structure as a secondary thought. If you're going to decide to have a dumping zone, 
be cognizant of the fact that you still have that, right? Be cognizant of the fact that you better do something with that data soon. Otherwise you're just storing lots of it and it's not very useful. So uh, hopefully that helps. And Simon, I'm sure you have your, uh, your context as well. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a similar kind of, um, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, it's taking the benefits of a lake and its benefit of the warehouse and being, you know, building a single solution that has the benefits of both. And it is exactly kind of those things that listen, you know, why do you build a warehouse? Because you're trying to do financial reporting and you need rigor. You need to be able to trust the data. You need auditability. You need governance. The, why is that missing records? Oh, someone actually made an update transaction and they removed a load of records. All of that kind of stuff, that is slow, right? So that's the kind of why people build warehouses. They love warehouses. And then they went, you know what? We can't react quickly enough. So there's kind of a big knee-jerk reaction away into lakes and the flexibility of lakes. And people find it loving lakes and all that stuff. And as you said, they forgot about all that good stuff. And so there's now a reaction against lakes of people going, they're not controlled enough. They, they don't have enough rigor. They don't have that discipline and auditing and all of that kind of stuff. And it's, it's essentially saying, can't we just build a platform that has the good stuff about lakes, the flexibility, the scalability, the ability to throw different types of data and react quickly, but put a layer over the top that allows for transaction history, for accountability, for security, for being able to roll back something like, you know, the ability to, oh, I didn't mean to hit that delete query and all your parquet files are gone. And you're like, oh, well, I don't have a backup. You know, just that kind of thing is, is massive. And that's, so for a long time, we've been building these things with like the modern data warehouse, which is a bit of lake and then slap a load of data into a warehouse and you've got the best of both worlds, kind of, but you're paying for both worlds and you're managing two systems. And that made a lot of sense because it's, there wasn't another choice, right? It's, to get over the to work around problems with both technologies just use both uh, and now that kind of the movement towards the lake house or kind of technically the unified analytics platform is the the academia name lake house databricks are kind of championing i've been using that term far too much uh is kind of that essentially doing it's it's bringing the warehouse functionality into the lake it's saying we want to improve our technology stack in the lake to be able to bring in those good warehousing features now, people in the warehousing world, they're trying to do the same to bring the good lakey, sparky bits into database systems. You're seeing more and more database systems adopt some kind of scalable sparky bits. So there's lot, basically everyone is kind of heading in this direction currently to say, they're both good ideas, why not both? And Lakehouse is the one we're champion here in terms of Spark, in terms of Databricks, in terms of doing it in the lake and making lakes able to have governed auditable data models in it. I think you hit it perfectly, dude. <laughs> cool. Um, let's see. We've got some other questions that are coming in from YouTube Live and LinkedIn. So let's start diving to actually answering some of those really quickly, if that's cool. Sure. All right. Uh, Karen, did you want to call them out or did you want me to go ahead and do it? I'm cool either way. Uh, sure. Yes. Yeah, so there's a few There's a few questions on uh, YouTube Live. Uh, sure. One of them is, will Lambda architecture depreciate soon because of Delta Lake? Ah, great question. So one thing to, to, to note real quick is that when it comes to the Lambda architecture, there, there's two facets to it. There is the one that's very, very, very transactional based. And that's very one that's more um, uh, OLAP DWBI based, okay, in terms of like the traditional way of saying things. Um, the reason I call this out is because when we talk about the Delta Medallion architecture, it's really meant for data warehousing like queries or OLAP BI like queries. It's not meant as a replacement for Lambda architecture for highly transactional systems. Okay. So uh, we, so when it comes specifically to Lambda, when we talk about that, uh, the bronze, silver, gold concepts of the Delta medallion architecture, we're specifically calling it out for, uh, you know, BI OLAP type queries, okay? Because this is a, don't forget, Delta Lake is not a transactional store. I mean, it can, it's obviously tr does transactions, but the transactional store is, is very much designed for OLAP qu queries. They're not designed for high uh, throughput, high concurrency um, transactional queries. Uh, you can try it and, and we've seen a, a modicum of success with it, but we certainly would not suggest it, right? I mean, this is one of those cases where, no, it's very much designed for the OLAP style queries, right? So, so in the case of Lambda architecture, uh, for all app style queries, yes, we feel that uh, because you can combine streaming and batch and do all these things together, that uh, the medallion architecture is simpler to maintain, simpler to run, 
simpler for everything. And so hence the reason. So from that standpoint, yes, we do think so. But uh, no, again, it's for OLAP, not for high concurrency transactional. That's not something we're trying to address here. Okay, so cool. I mean, Simon, anything a, you want to ask? Yeah. Call out to my boy Nathan Mars on the land and architecture. Just always Perfect. waiting, ready to go. Uh, and yeah, so I, I used to, I used to kind of champion Lambda quite a lot, right? Because um, it's coming. The, it, it's another one of those things, right? It's, it's a workaround around technological limitations. People are constantly banging, going, "My report needs to be real time," and you're like, "Does it?" <laughs> and then I need to have the thing that's constantly ticking away on my wall, and you're like, "But do we have to recalculate everything?" Um, and you get to that point, the whole Lambda architecture point of saying, I'm going to recalculate all of my data every hour, every kind of day, whatever it happens to be, and just top up with the stream. Uh, and that's complex, right? The complexity we've built into Lambda in terms of managing those two entirely different paths is painful. Now, that's not to say Delta, I've been doing a lot with Delta streaming and kind of all that kind of stuff over the past two weeks. And I've had some, I've had some wacky things that I could do if I could get onto that. Um, and it does simplify stuff, right? So saying I've just got one path, I'm just gonna run it and I can either just leave it running in its streams or I can just run it occasionally with a trigger once mechanism and it batches, I can do a bit of both. And having that simplicity of going through a single architecture, it's a lot simpler than doing the Lambda architecture. Is it as simple as having a batch architecture that runs as often as I actually need it to do, not just streaming for the sake of streaming? No. <laughs> uh, but yeah, certainly I no longer build Lambda architectures just because most of the time I can achieve it by having one single path. So for me, certainly in terms of that, as, as you said, the OLAP pattern that we used to have to build to enable streaming when we're dealing with large data architectures, I don't have to do that anymore, which is nice. I love it, dude. Does it really? <laughs> All right, Karen. <laughs> Karen, next question, please, for us. <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, let's see. There's a couple more questions on YouTube. Sure, live. sure, sure. But let's make sure to get uh, LinkedIn. It looks like we got a lot of questions on LinkedIn, so we want to make sure we get those too. <laughs> sure. Let's do one more question on uh, YouTube Live, and then we'll, we'll get some on LinkedIn. Uh, so Perfect. does Delta Lake support MOR? No problem. So great question. Does Delta Lake support merge on reads? We actually will have a session. I don't know if it's going to be scheduled for... November or December right now, but that actually is exactly what we're going to be doing. So just to provide some context, from some folks um, in terms of building transactional stores, they also use, uh, instead of using Delta Lake with Spark, they use Hootie or Iceberg, also great systems. Okay. Uh, obviously we're more for Delta Lake ourselves, but uh, we're not going to knock anybody else. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, one of the really cool uh, uh, components of Hootie is actually the concept of merge on read. Uh, um, so, in terms of um, uh, when you, in terms of that view, that ability to read that information. And so, in fact, like I said, we have a session that'll be coming up. Um, it's not on the official docket yet, but because we still have to finish the slides, minor technicality. So once we get that done, we'll put it on the official docket and we'll actually have a session that actually addresses this exact situation. So thanks for the question. And I do not believe this person is somebody from Databricks that we went ahead and hijacked the session. I believe this is actually a valid question, right? So. <laughs> Yes, it looks it looks like it. <laughs> cool. All right. So I did um, not pay anybody to put that question in. All right. Good. <laughs> uh, let's see on LinkedIn. Um, Denny, do you have do you have that up? I I do see. actually. Yes. Oh, okay. Cool. Perfect. Thank uh, you. Sure. Let me start that. Uh, can I read uh, 10 years later data using Delta Lake? So in other words, can I read data? that's like 10 years later on it. So I can answer, I'll start off and same idea, Simon, uh, you chime in with your, your context. But the, the kick quick thing is that underneath the covers of Delta Lake, it's parquet files, okay? That, that's the thing to remember. It's still parquet files. There is a transaction log that allows us to track which version of the files and how you read that transaction uh, log is completely open source, okay? So we've documented, we've commented the code. So even if you don't read the documents, you could literally comment the code. But for all intents and purposes, what's happening is that because you can have multiple versions, sorry, multiple parquet files, uh, because we have uh, MVCC, multiple version con concurrency control, okay? To simplify how we save 
files when you do inserts, updates, and deletes, and everything else. You can actually have different versions of the table. Uh, what's great about that concept is that we have this concept called time travel that allows us to go back in time. And I'm sure Simon's got wonderful stories about oops and <laughs> a time how time travel has saved everything. Okay, But nevertheless, the context is that because there's different versions of the files available, um, even if you weren't to read the transaction log directly, you could all you'd actually have to do is run one API that would generate a manifest file. The manifest file basically is just a file that says, here are all the parquet files that you need to go read. If then you can read that manifest file, grab all the parquet files that are listed inside there, bam, now you can read, know exactly which version of the files you're supposed to be reading, and then you can read the table anyways, okay? And by the way, it's a huge advantage that we actually are using uh, this manifest or the transaction log itself. The reason why is because um, listing lots of files from cloud object stores is actually really, really slow, uh, exceedingly slow. Well, we're not making you list that now. What we're doing is simply reading the transaction log. It has a list of files inside there. So now your Spark job, or for that matter, any job that wants to read the Parquet files knows exactly which files to, 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 to query as opposed to actually explicitly listing every single file and trying to find out which file you want to use. And so at least that's, so in other words, yes, this is a long-winded answer in terms of giving you a little bit of the internals, but yes, you should be absolutely able to read it 10 years later, provided you can read Parquet. And so that's the real key, uh, the real kicker, basically. However, Simon, yes. <laughs> what, what are the, so when, when the whole temporal querying thing came out, I had a whole slew of people go, awesome, I've been building crazy, slowly changing dimension things for so long, right? I don't need to do that anymore. I can just use temporal queries. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can, if you really like storing a hell of a lot of redundant data. And that's the thing to be aware of, right? When you're talking about, I've got a parquet file, a parquet file is immutable, right? You can't change it. So the whole mechanism that the guys have built is, if I want to update one record in that, I make an entire copy of that whole parquet file with the changed record. And I copy over a load of extra records from that. And so my history is all these different snapshots of that whole data. And I might be just doing tiny little changes and I'm keeping a whole set of each file that changed in that set. And if you're trying to say, I want to keep 10 years worth of history and you're changing that data a lot, you're going to have masses and masses of redundant data. So it's not going to slow things down. As Danny said, it's just going to query only the files it needs, but you're going to have a huge, huge volume of data that hasn't changed between various different updates, but you're just keeping for that temporal snapshot. So we tend to think about, um, we use temporal queries as kind of like, almost like a transactional backup, right? Mm -hmm. So we have like seven days, 30 days, something like that rolling copy of any time I change it, I can go back and fix it. It's my safety net. If I happen to delete everything, I can go, let's undo that. But it's not my historical record. It's not my, this record was active from this date to this date. It's not slowly changing. You know, so we tend to, if we're doing that kind of pattern, we say we need to keep a historical snapshot of the state of each record. <coughs> Just doing it in Delta is a very expensive way to do that from a storage cost. So we tend to do, we use type four a lot, just to be a bit Yes. Wise. You know, yes, so we'll have yes. our like, current table and then we'll have our history table and we let history, you know, we do it as an update query and we say, we'll set the end date. We do Kimball style. I know, dirty words. Mm -hmm. But no, 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 not at all. That's awesome. No, no, uh, yeah, no, I will fight anybody uh, who says Kimball's dirty. Yeah, 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 yeah we're good. <laughs> but yeah, so that, that's the only thing. Obviously, you can keep history as long as you want to keep history. As long as you want to pay for the redundant storage that you're keeping in that history, you can keep it for as long as you want, right? But just, just don't use it for slowly changing just because it's really expensive. <laughs> oh, absolutely. In, in fact, we actually have a call out and there's a summit session from uh, 2020, uh, sorry, uh, Spark and AI Summit 2020 North America. Um, man, I'm forgetting the name of the session, but uh, it's something like Des Delta Lake Disaster Recovery Best Practices. Um, I think that was a call, but it's with E.T. Vice. Um, um, uh, and inter uh, he was one of the uh, speakers of the session. I'm forgetting the name of the other guy. My apologies to that guy. It's not done on purpose. But the reason why I'm calling that out is because they actually call out exactly what you just said, Simon. Um, they call out that like, in like there is that concept of type four slash historical table, table concepts, historical snapshots, right? So if you want historical snapshots, yeah, 
create a historical snapshot then. Like literally just go create it then um, at that point in time. And then, uh, then and, uh, um, and so then what will happen is that you have, let's just say a monthly fiduciary snapshot, right? So yeah, take a snapshot of it. Um, uh, once you copy the data over, then basically do a vacuum. That means it'll remove all of the files except for that snapshot. So then now you're taking a lot less space. Uh, you can basically put it on more cold store or, you know, an Amazon uh, parlance glacier, you know, systems. So whenever you need to get access to it, you can, but it's that way it's really cheap. And um, the one thing I would add to that is actually uh, it's a small call out to Databricks. We actually just recently introduced this concept of shallow clones and deep clones of your tables. So basically this exact example, that's exactly what you, you would do a deep clone, once it's cloned, you've got the all of it, all the metadata, everything, vacuum it up, boom. Now you've got a copy, you store that in cold storage or a colder storage and you're good to go. And so exactly to what Simon's calling out, you definitely don't wanna be holding like 10 years of transactions in there. That would be a little bit more on the painful side. <laughs> so. And I, so I feel bad about clone because the clone caught me by surprise, right? You guys just, it just snuck into a runtime. I was like, right, what's in the new run? Clone. What? Why would I need to copy a table? What? And then since then, I've come up with like just so many different use cases. I'm like, I can use clone for that. I'm yeah, we, 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 we've been meaning to, and it's probably on me, by the way. We've been meaning to write some new blogs to actually explain the scenarios because we're like, <laughs> oh crap, we forgot to do that, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Oh crap. Yeah, so it's it's definitely on our docket of things to realize there's actually a lot of really good scenarios that we just didn't bother explaining why you need to do it. But it, it was obviously generated from customer interest, so that's why we created them. But exactly to your point, it's not obvious, but then when you start playing with it, you realize, oh crap, <laughs> right? There's a lot of really good things here. Let's so. see. Oh, we've tweaked the merge statement so it uses different logic. Uh, can we yeah. test it in live? It's like normally. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because merge, you're doing inserts and updates at the same time to like, you know, 15, 20% of the table. That won't impact anything. Well, it won't do a shallow clone, merge into that, and it's fine. Exactly. We, we, we just keep surprising ourselves by finding more things like that of going, oh, actually, yeah, just, just clone it. Why didn't we do that earlier? <laughs> <laughs> So it is, yeah, I'd say kind of anyone who hasn't really looked into it, shallow cloning specifically, yeah. uh, just super useful of saying, I want something that looks like the table, but I'm not copying the data over until I make any changes. Yeah, just crazy. Cool. All right. Let's dive into some more questions. Uh, th this is an old, more of an old school Spark one, which isn't still nice. Uh, which one's better to use between PySpark and Scala for Spark? Are there any differences in terms of performance? You want to dive into that right away, Simon? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so again, modern Spark, as long as you're using data frames, as long as you are using data frames, there is no performance difference whatsoever between PySpark, Scala, R, SQL. It all goes through the Catalyst engine currently currently <laughs> until photon -y weirdness comes out. Um, and so essentially, as long as you're doing data frame transformations, there's zero difference. Uh, if you come to the point when you're off the, if you're bringing libraries in and you grab like any old Python library, any old R library, and it's not a PySpark or Spark R library, then that might have performance differences. If you're writing a UDF, so you're writing your own custom function and you're just writing straight old Python, then the differences of Python and R don't compile down to Java. So Spark entirely runs inside a thing called a JVM, a Java virtual machine. So when you try and run this little bit of Python, if you're writing PySpark on top of a data frame, that just runs. It gets turned into Java bytecode and everyone's happy. If you've got a little bit of custom bit of Python that has to call out for, that has to go outside the JVM and there's an interop and you can get it faster with things like vectorized and panda, pandas UDFs, but it's never as fast as doing it in a data frame. So as long as you are doing pure data frame, transactions, then there's zero difference. Just be a little bit careful if you're bringing in random libraries or you're building your own functions. Cool. And I'd, just to add to Simon's call out, exactly what he said, the one awesome improvement that we did do is um, specifically when you do create UDFs, at least in Python, make sure it's a vectorized UDF. Okay. We, uh, it's certainly, uh, the, we did a bunch of improvements in Spark 2.3. We did a bunch of improvements in Spark 3.0. Uh, but the call out basically is that if you build a vectorized 
UDF uh, or, or sorry, pandas UDF, vectorize the old name, pandas the current name. So if you build a pandas UDF, then what ends up happening is that basically um, it's able to still take advantage of the, uh, of the distributed nature of the Spark engine. And so then you can distribute everything anyway. So you'll often see us use pandas UDFs to distribute even what is conceivably a single node uh, um, uh, um, deep learning library or machine learning library or machine learning algorithm. But because we're using it as a, as a pandas UDF, we're actually able to vectorize it, distribute it, and bam, you're, fl up, uh, you're flying nicely. So that's the quick call out there. Okay. So is that is that the use case when you'd see that kind of using a pandas UDF? If you're trying to pull in a library that traditionally single node and you want it to have some element of vectorization, then yeah. wrap it up and you'll get some uh, distance. Exactly. Perfect. All right. Uh, let's go into other LinkedIn. Uh, hey, Karen, do you want to dive into those or do you want me to dive into those LinkedIn live questions? Sure. Yeah. There's another question on LinkedIn. So uh, oh, one on Databricks. What is the best or most recommended method to registry and monitoring pipeline logs? Ooh, pipeline logs. Okay, that's a little bit more detailed. Okay, so now in the case of pipeline logs, are, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually make it a two part question, just because there's two different ways of, of interpreting that statement. Okay, you can talk about pipeline logs in terms of Spark pipeline logs, like as in you're doing ETL processing, or you can also think about it in terms of machine learning pipeline logs. Okay, so I'm gonna do the easier one first, which is machine learning. Okay, so in the case of machine learning. I would just simply use MLflow, okay? Uh, the reason why I use MLflow is because I can just basically, uh, when you work with, especially in the Databricks ecosystem, but this is even part, uh, a sizable chunk of this stuff is actually even available within OSS MLflow, by the way. I wanna be very clear about that. Um, automatically, the tracking of the metrics, of the parameters is automatic actually in MLflow. So it'll just track all of those different things as part of your pipeline. So when you build an ML pipeline, like you do um, uh, TDIDF, you're doing some linear regression or logistic regression, whatever it is that you're doing, right? A lot of this stuff actually is automatically recorded. So you don't really need to, and from a machine learning perspective, like log as much stuff because it's all the parameters and, and information you care about is automatically logged into MLflow anyways. Okay, in the case of Spark pipelines though, in other words, the data processing, uh, if you're talking about data specific, I do think that, you know, especially if you're like a customer of ours already, then you may wanna ping us later on about Delta pipelines. Uh, we, we talked about this in the past, um, but the context basically is that there are mechanisms that will simplify within the Databricks ecosystem and how you can automatically log and have lineage uh, and so, uh, to, when, you, when it comes to processing your data. In the case of you're saying, no, no, I'm just looking for open source Spark pipelines. Okay, that's fair. So in terms of that ETL process, what you really wanna do is you wanna, in, it's really dependent on which cloud infrastructure you're actually working with. For example, like if you're in Azure, do you wanna log some of those events or some of those occurrences within Azure Log Analytics, right? Or if you wanna do the same thing within the uh, uh, same system with AWS. And so, or do you feel that it's okay to save the logs directly into in essence, your own Delta table <laughs> uh -huh, uh, that actually logs all these things. And then you can read that. Every single one of those statements has their pros and there's cons. And so what, Obviously, with the, the former, you're integrating within the cloud ecosystem. And if you have other systems that you're also working with within Azure or in AWS, respectively, then there's the advantage of that. The advantage of writing it out yourself is that actually you can put a level of detail and a debugging level that you would not necessarily have had by using some other system. And so it really depends on what is it you're trying to achieve? And so I, I, I apologize for being a little bit more vague, but as you can probably guess, we can really rat hole on this one. So that's the reason why I'm gonna stop right now. <laughs> and Simon, I'm sure you've got uh, some context or some concepts that you'd love to add as well, so. I mean, yeah, I mean, I can talk about what we do. You know, so Perfect. from, my, um, from yeah. our framework point of view, we tend to classify it as we've got kind of, um, I guess, application level logging and telemetry level logging. You know, so we're in Azure. So we've got Databricks, you can just poke it and say, kick out logs to log analytics. 
um, we have a, like a little custom function wrapper that we kind of poke and say, add some more contextual logs, add a load of more parameters, take the output of Spark streaming, get the reads and progress and put that out to log analytics. And so there's a few things where if it's fairly verbose, we'll also push that to log analytics. Um, but then a lot of what we're doing, a lot of the processing, we're driving based on metadata. So we have like a little tiny SQL DB, which is just, what have I processed? What did my job queue? What's all that kind of stuff? And that's more just a, it's called quite, you know, just poke. So it's got like, you've got application logging of, I'm at this step, I've done this, I've finished that job kind of thing. We'll poke one way. And then more just verbose. This is just the general state of stuff. We'll throw out to log analytics. Mainly because, I actually said, I mean, we've got, we're in Azure, we've got data factory, we've got SQL DB, we've got loads of other things that are also kicking their logs out to their central place. And you don't end up with like, well, no one likes siloed data, right? And logs isn't the type of data, so just put it all in one place and then you can go diving in it. So for us, that makes sense for us. Cool, rock on, dude. All right, uh, there's a, we only have about 11 minutes left or actually probably, oh, sorry, we need to make sure that we have time for Karen to, to wrap things up. So okay. more like like six minutes left. So, okay, let me stream through some real quick questions that I just noticed on LinkedIn Live so at least I can answer as, some, as many of them as fast as I can before we get into some of the more uh, detailed ones. Um, all right, uh, does Delta Lake use MVCC as a concur concurrency algorithm? Uh, it does, uh, that's the quick question, uh, answer on that one. Uh, it does because the idea is that we are copying the files down and we're replicating it. So in some ways, just like Simon called out earlier, it's, um, it's messier from the standpoint that it uses more storage, but in return for that, you actually have, you can replay and recreate the entire table from scratch, which is really, really nice, okay? Um, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Can we have an advanced version of notebooks and workspace for developers for writing code? And excuse, we'd like to have IDE-like features. Yes. Uh, with Databricks, you can actually use Databricks Connect that allows your IDE to talk to your of choice, like Visual Studio Code, or yes, I actually said Visual Studio Code, uh, or <laughs> IntelliJ or whatever else to go ahead and actually talk to Databricks as well. So no problem at all. Uh, how is versioning happening in Delta Lake? Uh, just as we called out, the MVCC uh, automatically, as part of the transaction log, automatically takes that care of that for you. Uh, let's see. I think that was... Oh, here we go. Uh, final one. That's a fast question. Sorry. Uh, do we need to optimize and vacuum Delta format tables for storage optimization on a regular basis uh, if we don't bother about versioning? Uh, is there no default Spark configuration setup? Uh, the defaults for optimize and va vacuum are basically seven days for the data, 30 days for the log, okay? Um, the idea is that when you instantiate a Delta table, the whole purpose is that you wanna be able to go ahead and do changes to the table. So by the very definition of it, you will go ahead and have a version because you're inserting new data into it or you're updating or you're deleting or merging or whatever else. Um, if you're going to go with the defaults, usually that's more than good enough because when you run uh, like, you know, a compaction or when you run a vacuum or whatever else, it'll actually remove the data. So there's only like seven days worth of data, for example, stored inside there. Um, and so that'll keep the, the table relatively small in comparison. That means there's only seven days worth of data, quote unquote, that's, uh, uh, that has possible, not the not duplication, but seven days of versions of data, I should say. Um, and you still need to go ahead and run that job. They weren't exactly. happening. That's correct. Uh, just to make sure those people, you need to run an optimize for it to optimize, unless you've got auto optimize, which is slightly different, and you need to run a vacuum for it to use those seven days. It's just there to default what's going to happen if you just throw those commands with no other settings. Just go, it's got it going on. Perfect. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, let's let's uh, for the last like one or two questions. How about we dive into Simon, a favorite of ours. Uh, this one I think is from YouTube. Uh, what's the best way to generate surrogate keys for your lake house concept? <sighs> it depends on <laughs> every time. Um, yeah, Damn, baby. <laughs> well, so you got basically three different paths that people take. Uh, and it depends on, so so often we go, here's the most performant route. And people go, oh, but it's not pretty. <laughs> and you're like, Ugh. So option one that we use most of the time is hashing. So actually not surrogate keying at all, just throwing a hash over a composite of whatever makes your primary key, whatever makes your change key, throwing that in there, and then actually kind of putting the pain on the person reading it. Now, obviously that's 
if you're doing lots of, you know, if you need to be doing, joining between facts and dimensions and working on that point, and you've got an SCD style table, yeah, that's painful. So you need to do something else to try and generate the key in there. Um, but lots of the times we try and avoid doing it because that kind of thing can be a little painful. Um, you've got things like the monotonically increasing ID, everyone's favorite named PySpark function, uh, which is that just, I want to generate a increment, kind of like generating an identity, right? Except you're not forcing a sort order. So if you try and do like a window function with row number, then you're actually forcing it to sort your data and actually just do all that. And that's never going to be particularly fast. Whereas monotonically increasing ID will give you a, an increasing ID um, inside each of your partitions, which is much, much more efficient, but it's not, never going to look quite as pretty as your existing things. But it means you end up doing the, what's my maximum row currently in my dimension table? Add, in, add that to my monotonically increasing ID I'm getting from my new ones and then put that in. Um, that means you can't quite do merges the same way. Um, so it kind of depends on how quick you want your ETL to be. If you're desperate to have survey keys, then there are patterns you can do around that kind of manual generation, which feels super old school, right? It feels like we're going back in time before databases had identity columns, because we kind of are. <laughs> Perfect. So let me add to Simon's point. Uh, we're going to need to uh, share this, by the way. So. Um, the reason I'm saying Simon's point is because we actually had a tech talk mm -hmm. on August 25th on this exact topic. Introduction to surrogate key generation for your lake house. And again, this was not a question that was posed by anybody that I know. Uh, so thank you very much for, for posing the question on YouTube Live. <laughs> we actually call that out. And if it's okay with you, the reason I'm showing is because I have a ton of Stargate SG-1 references inside there. So that tells you how much of a geek I am. So this entire surrogate key concept, because it said SJ, surrogate key, and then I thought of SG, and then as soon as I thought of SG, I'm thinking, hey, Stargate. And then now I had a, a lame ass reason to go ahead and go somehow include Samantha Carter because she's awesome of SG-1 into the concept of surrogate keys. So there is a, uh, we'll share that particular notebook out to everybody. <laughs> uh, before we close off, let me go ahead and uh, uh, do two questions. I just realized I forgot to ask from Zoom. One was that, um, does Delta Lake Hammond help with managing the schema? Yes. Uh, Delta Lake itself does schema evolution and schema enforcement. So there is this concept of a schema. The schema is actually stored within the transaction log itself, not in the footer file of the parquet files. So that will simplify things, number one. And so for history, and Simon, I'd love you to chime in on this one. Uh, the, as the last part, do you still recommend implementing an SCD design for history? Bam. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> If you need history, absolutely. Um, again, as we said, type four is, is my preferred, just because it means people can quit, because surrogate keys can be a little bit awkward to generate, then separating out between, this is my current table, I can just join straight to it without having to worry about uh, temporal context, or go into my history table, and at that point, I can add the complexity of choosing the right version of the right time, and do a range skew join, and pass in the range skew join hint, which speeds that stuff up then yeah, you've got that choice and making it simple by separating out the current and the historical definitely makes things faster and makes ETL a little bit simpler. And especially if you're doing things like you can do Delta streaming now, if you want to go crazy, where you update your current table and then stream out those changes to your historical table. So you can kind of like asynchronously offset the creation of your history from your insert if you want to make things fancy. Bam. All right. That's it for today. Karen, definitely wrap it up. Uh, we apologize to all the folks that we did not get to answer the questions. I think that sort of implies that we're going to have to do a third one of these, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> as long as there's more questions, which by the looks of it, there are. <laughs> yes. Yeah, just a few. So yeah. And this time it wasn't our fault. So this is good. All right. Karen, sorry, please. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Thanks, Denny. Thanks, Simon. And thanks, everyone, for all of your questions. Um, again, apologies for not getting to the, to all of them. But like Penny said, uh, we might have to plan a third session. So I guess guess we'll see uh, what scheduling looks like, maybe. Um, but thanks, everyone, for joining us. And I just dropped the, the link again to our Data Plus AI online meetup group in uh, LinkedIn and YouTube Live and in the Zoom chat. So that's the best way to, to get notified of our upcoming uh, sessions. So we have, again, we have our next uh, Data Cloud Lab 
uh, which is next Tuesday um, with Denny and uh, Franco. So um, hope you all can join us and uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. And uh, thanks, take care. Uh, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody, take care.